All right, we've heard you advocate the teaching of, of uh, <clears throat> maleness and femaleness, but uh, what about a practical handle on that? Just how do parents go about doing that? Gil, that's the controversial part, and it's the part that I'm sure many people would di will disagree with. But I believe that it should be done through clothing. I think boys' clothing ought to look different than girls' clothing. Yes, I really don't agree with what I've heard you say so far. My grandmother raised her eight boys and girls. There was four of each, I think, uh, pretty much in the same way. Didn't give them particular roles. Uh, my parents raised myself and my four brothers and sisters in much the same way. And I would like to know what you consider to be the differences a sex should have. My father-in-law was a chef. My children cook. My husband cooks. I've got two boys and a girl. We should all have companionship and love. Granted, I can't go up on the roof and maybe haul around some big, heavy things. That's a physical difference. Where is the difference between male and female roles? See, this, this is what I meant when I said I'm not really concerned about the job that adults have, and I really mean that. I'm not concerned that, uh, that we keep a, just a tight delineation of, uh, of professional roles and so on. I am concerned that boys know their boys and girls know their girls. Don't you think the value of teaching male-female roles is the fact that homosexuality is so acceptable today, and it is sin, and it can destroy our country if we take history as an example? And I think that's why it's so important that we teach male-femaleness. There is a, a great deal of confusion and uh, misinformation in regard to homosexuality, and I admit to you all the answers are not in. There are many people that feel that it's largely genetic, that it, uh, a child is born with it. There are other people that feel that it results from a peaking of testosterone, the male hormone, at about three months of age, which fixes the brain as masculine or feminine. The only answer that I would have to that is that if it were merely genetic or something that was going to occur routinely, then it wouldn't vary in incidence from society to society. You wouldn't have what I would consider to be epidemics, as I believe we're experiencing at this time. Before we present this next group of excerpts, let me repeat that these final moments are better suited for adult viewers, because the subject at hand is sexual problems in marriage, and the discussion is quite frank. Have you ever seen uh, people, you know, all colors, shapes, and sizes, but especially women who were wearing tight sweaters, but emblazoned on her bosoms were signs like, uh, I'm ready, I'm hot, uh, treat them tenderly, <laughs> I'm available, soft and lush. What you see is what you get. <laughs> <laughs> to bring an example of this, supposing a husband comes home, there's no smile, there's no kiss, there's no communication. He orders her up to the bedroom to disrobe and then begins to mount, okay? I have read that simultaneous orgasm is a goal to be reached for. And um, in my experience, my wife and I enjoy each other's orgasm so much that when we come close to simultaneous orgasm, we feel frustrated and uh, it can be an intrusion. Can you comment on that? It may be a target, but not a necessity. But not a necessity. All right. What do couples have to look forward to in terms of sex after 60 or 65 years old? <laughs> this is Gil Meggerly for Dr. James Dobson and all of us at Focus on the Family, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the strengthening of the American family. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>